environment. All right, that is all for me. I'd like to hand it over to Loretta. Thank you so much, Colleen. And You're once welcome. again, welcome everybody. Um, so here we go. Um, tonight, we're here because um, we want to share with you some um, very important free educational resources. And, and I think free is the most important element here, but also educational resources in your ELT classroom. So this is our topic for tonight. And uh, we're more than happy to have you here, even though it's summer, even though school is over for many of us, we're still here. We're still teaching and learning from one another. So let's immediately start with um, our, did I froze? Okay. So let's immediately start with our presenters for tonight. Um, our first one is Chadia Mansour. And I'm sure that uh, some of you got to know Chadia in our previous um, TESOL dialect session, the one last month. So thank you for joining us tonight, Chadia. Um, Chadia Mansour holds a BA in English for Academic Purposes from Tunisia, an MA in Applied Linguistics from USA, and is currently an all but dissertation ABD, a doctoral student in distance education and online learning in Canada, working on her research on online second language acquisition. She also holds the Fulbright Foreign Languages Teaching Certificate, TESOL Certificate, Certificate of College Teaching, Cambridge Assessment English Certificate of Teaching Online, and the Canadian College of Educators Portfolio Based Language Assessment Certificate. Chadia has 20 years of experience in language teaching in higher education, including ESL, EFL, EAP, ESV, and discourse on language across cultures internationally in Tunisia, USA, and Qatar. Chadia also has an extensive experience in languages, English and Arabic curriculum and instructional design for in-person and blended learning. So once again, thank you for joining us tonight, Chadia. Thank you for having us. It's great to have you here with us again. Uh, our second presenter for tonight is Sharon Chayden Glass. Um, Sharon is a well-known name, just as Chadia is. <laughs> I'm sure you've encountered her on social media, on LinkedIn, or um, on her various TESOL presentations. So Sharon Tatum Glass is an instructional media designer for Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Ohio. She previously taught ESL in U.S. universities for 13 years. She serves as, as the community manager for TESOL International's Intercultural Communication Interest Section, and hosts monthly Zoom networking sessions between educators and instructional designers. Thank you for joining us tonight, Sharon. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's get started. Our first uh, introductory questions for tonight are, so what are some of the limitations of traditionally published educational materials and digital learning products? So I'd like to invite Sharon and Chadia to share their opinions on this. Chadia? All right, I'll, I'll take that one. Yes, thank you. Um, so, well, as we all know, teachers heavily rely on traditional educational resources for, or in, for teaching, right? For classroom separation or in outside of the classroom, et cetera. Yet traditionally published educational materials are li limited when it comes to even their format, right? They usually come into the form of textbooks or uh, workbooks or uh, manuals, teachers' manuals. Sometimes we have some test banks or audio CDs. Um, one of these options are not, it's compared to the other options, uh, non-traditional educational resources is, is uh, considered very, very limited, right? Not many options at all. And um, the other limitation is related to cost. And that's very important, right? The word cost itself is right nowadays, unfortunately, and we're in 2021, it's still it's a social justice issue, right? And uh, an equity issue as well. Because mostly both of us, uh, teachers and also our learners, uh, have to pay for, for these materials, right? Um, and I remember when I was, uh, when I was a student in, in the United States, um, I, that was it was a fortune. I, I was working as a research assistant and I and a teaching assistant uh, as well. And uh, I had extra money here and there, you know, tutoring and all just to afford one course book 
right? And sometimes I have to to buy it used or um, you know borrow from somebody. It was it was it's not like okay when you say cost, it's so many stories that we can share, right? In Tunisia, for instance, um, is the other way around. There isn't uh, there aren't any textbooks, and uh, what we used to do is. Uh, one of the professors would buy the textbook and then we have to, to, to Xerox it back then, right? And we buy the <laughs> copyright issue in the United States who would be all legally put in jail, right? But that's uh, those are the resources that we have, right? And um, that's how it worked. And we pay money and that money just for Xerox is a lot. So you end up having like uh, sections of chapters of books. So cost is is a big issue um and and it's still valid in so many parts of the world whether the developed or the, the developing countries or the under resources for everybody and other than that the these traditional resources the in many cases they are inappropriate to student population or the students needs and many of us can relate to that right um no matter what kind of textbook the university or in this institution or the school, you know, uh, would provide, because of the fact of the how we have um, international students sometimes, right? Or many, like in Tesla, Ontario, we have adult learners and new immigrants uh, here or across Canada. Basically, it's very diverse, so it's really it's really hard to kind of find the right textbook that, that you need for, for your particular uh, student. So, and that's also a big issue. Um, and another very important limitation is the fact that they're very difficult to adapt. You have the textbook, you can't really change because it's not in the electronic format. Or even if it's in the uh, electronic format, there is the issue of copyright. So you cannot really edit or change or adapt it and make the changes that will really meet the need to your own students, right? So for digital learning products, such as the campaigning websites, some of the textbooks that, that have their own campaigning websites, um, or the copyrighted eBooks, also for, for, for that, for those uh, materials, security can make access very difficult, right? And also include the burden of, again, cost for teachers and learners. So these are briefly the very, um, you know, the limitation of traditional resources. If uh, anybody else could add, it would be, you know, they're welcome if their own context, right? I'd like always to, to learn as well, right? <laughs> From others, because we have different contexts and, and people have different challenges. I want to jump on what you were saying about the um, security with the digital learning products. Um, sometimes even if my, I remember uh, we used to, I used to have, I was required. I didn't get to choose that. These are the books and these are the things that students need to buy. And one of them was um, the Betty Azar's online learning component that went with the book. And I, probably used that for two years and we had five terms in each year. So 10 times every term, it was such a headache. Even if they bought the code, you know, getting them on the website, getting them use the registration key, make a password. Oh, well, you, you already, you already registered. So, but now it's a new term. So we got to get you in a new class and like, we'd spend so much time just going through these things that publishers would set up for security so they can make money was just like, I just want to teach. <laughs> can I just get to what we're supposed to learn instead of spending an hour and a half at the beginning of every term talking about how do we get you online to the online learning component? And then not even that was enough. Then I would have to see them in my office. I can't, I don't know, my key won't work. You know, it's just like, I want to be done. So. And so we used to have the publishers come to us at Qatar University and uh, to train teachers themselves who really don't have the time just to be able to have all of that login information and every single publisher has something different and a more complicated process than the other. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, um, yes, uh, security and access. Um, those are very big issues as well when it comes to the digi digital traditional resources. Yeah. Great.
great. Chadia and Sharon, thank you so much for your responses. Now we want to open it up to the audience. Remember that you are also experts here. We all have something to contribute today. So please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to say something out loud or alternatively, you can also type your message in the chat and I'll read it out loud for you. Also, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or type that in the chat as well. We want to get this conversation going and I'm really excited for it. I like the energy, Colleen. <laughs> Thank you, Chadia. Love that. <laughs> uh, so far, I don't see any hands up yet, but that's perfectly fine. You know me, I'm a talker. So um, Chadia, you actually got me thinking when you talked about adapting, um, you know, the content that we have in this print. Um, something for me that's really important is I like my materials to reflect the people in my classroom. And depending on how old your textbooks are, sometimes they don't. And I find that things like, um, you know, I want to raise awareness about things like um, 2S plus LGBTQ topics. And I want to be able to talk about intercultural issues that are happening. And that's not, that's not available, depending on how old your textbooks are. They even have things that you shouldn't be mentioning in there. So I love when you mentioned that, that you know, adaptability, it's lacking or it's expensive or you're not supposed to do it, right? So that was a really great point that you mentioned for me. Yes, and also the you brought up um, you know topics like LGBTQ and uh, intercultural uh, communication, you know, or minorities in general, mm -hmm. represented uh, minorities. Um, you you don't see them in textbooks, right? They, they're not represented in the intercultural in the culture it, itself. Like uh, one of the issues because I I taught in the United States, I taught in Qatar, I taught in Tunisia uh, as well, and one of the things of the textbooks is culture, right? Mm -hmm. So the debate is we're, we're teaching the target language. So, and language is inseparable from culture, right? So we have to also teach uh, the, the target uh, culture of that particular language, which is, which is English, for instance. Um, the, other, the other part of the world, the new, and I was perfectly fine with that when I was in the US and even in Tunisia, it was the same approach. But when I went to the Middle East in the Qatar in particular, it was, it was a different approach. It was, okay, I, I'd like to learn English, yes, for communicative purposes, and um, but I really would like to be able to express and communicate, uh, uh, you know, about my own culture. And I'd like to see examples in the textbooks uh, that represent my culture, right? That was like eye-opening for me. Like, I never thought about it that way before. I'm like, oh, yeah, so... <laughs> So that's also something about traditional um, textbooks, the culture in general and intercultural competence and, you know, uh, minorities. Chadia, speaking of what you just said, we have Monica in the chat and Monica says, I always tell my students they're learning Southern Ontario English from me. That's a great point there, Monica. <laughs> Thank you. I'll tell you a little joke. My partner, he, I always um, tease at him because I tell him that he has the perfect Southern Ontario accent. If you can think of the perfect Southern Ontario accent, that's him. So I always tease him for that purpose and it reminds me of what you just said, Monica. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any other comments or any hands up, but I, I think that we're still getting warmed up and it's a great topic. So I wanna to touch on something that Sharon said. Those keys for those textbooks. No doubt. No they can often stop our students from wanting to even engage with us or wanting to do their coursework because it's so difficult. And I put in the chat, imagine that you yourself, you're a language learner and you have this barrier of not being able to sign up for your course. That would stop me in my tracks. So these are things we have to think about. Is it user-friendly, accessibility? Who are we, which kind of students are we impacting, right? And how can we try and get around that? So Sharon, I mean, if maybe you could speak a little bit more about that. I know that we're, this is not the point of today's discussion, but perhaps mm. what are some methods that you've used when you kind of go through those difficulties? I don't know if I have an answer for, I, I honestly, I hope it's gotten better because the years that it was really rough was like 2012 to 2015, we were trying to do those online companion sites. And I was like, I don't know what, this is really helping, you know, if it is yeah. helping. Yeah. Oh, you have a hand up. Oh, yeah. I do. Thank you. I see the wonderful Gummel with her hand up. Please go ahead. 
I was just going to comment on in Sharon's um, statement about, you know, having extra resources, the keywords or the key password that you put it in comes in the book. Unfortunately, we are in 2021. And at the moment, I'm teaching for a summer course for Niagara College. And this is our book. And oh, yeah, cute. E-copy. And they do have, so they have two websites. So book comes with the code, one code for the book, another code for the activities but they always struggle. All up to now, like we started almost past three weeks. So there are still some, and I created a class so I can keep track who is practicing and who is not. Mm -hmm. And then I can see the sign in student. I have like 15 students, only eight able to sign in. The other one's still struggling or it's not trying. I don't know because mm -hmm. of online, I can't keep track, but it's difficult. I, as a teacher, I struggled a lot, but um, they have great services for instructors who are having difficulty. So this person gave me one-on-one -on -one tutoring that I how I can overcome with it, that I can able to help my students. But it, it's still the huge pain. They don't make it very user-friendly, too complex. They don't realize it's their second language. Many things up on the system is so difficult for them to comprehend. Mm -hmm. And once, mm -hmm. once they've bought that book, they can't resell it because they've used that code. And then they, so they, and they don't know that. They give it to their friend. They think they're doing a nice thing for their friend. And their friend's like, well, I got this book from my friend. And you're like, yeah, but now you don't have a code. So you can't get on the site and they're like oh and i'm like i don't want to buy the book i'm like i i get it but you know what capitalism <laughs> in qatar they didn't have a, in qatar they do not have an issue uh, my students did not have a, a a cost issue money issue but in in tunisia it's a big issue for instance mm -hmm. an international student as i mentioned it was a big issue for me um what to, to go back to the uh, colleen's question about what do you do uh, all these difficulties to access these uh, courses well with my students because you mentioned they have uh, uh gono mentioned that they it's not their language so i was lucky because i speak the language i speak arabic so i was having a lot of those you know it's it's time consuming extra office hours and extra uh what's up my students were with me on WhatsApp. My students were with me in bed. <laughs> like, pretty much like on WhatsApp. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I'm in bed. I'm just responding to students. You know, what can you do? They're stuck. They cannot access. They don't know what to do. So a lot of uh, uh, WhatsApp and mobile, uh, you know, communication for the in spots, you know, um, kind of assistant on the spot assistance and a lot of uh, bilingual, you know, for them to be able to uh, kind of overcome that problem of access. Yeah. Thank you, Charia, so much. We're going to go on to Shahira. Hi, everyone. Can you Hi. hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I, I face this problem like uh, a lot of times with my students, like uh, having getting the access. So the easiest way is like two ways I used to, to um, tell my students about one of them is that they should like uh, contact the publisher. So they, they would find the like uh, go for technical help and usually it would work out. And if it's like, if it doesn't work out, so I would gather all the names of the students and give it to my, the program coordinator and she would contact again the publisher, of course, because they are always buying books from them and then the digital products. So it, it would be easier. So this is one of one, two ways I would like, I wanted to share with you. Yes. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, Kul, Kulsum is saying. Right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, so in the chat, I, I was just, I was just thinking about what Shahira said. Shahira, you distracted me, my dear, my goodness. <laughs> uh, but Ume uh, in the chat, she says, in my opinion, we can keep one book and then add up on top of it. You know what, Ume, that's a great point. I can see how you can do it, but we can also see how sometimes that can be a bit complex or even almost more complicated than just finding a good resource. So I do get your point there. I definitely do. Um, with that being said, I think we've been on this topic for quite some time. Uh, Loretta, if you want to move us on, that'd be great. Yes. And I think now, based on all this conversation we had on traditional resources, we're ready to talk about open educational resources. So what are they? How can we make great use of them? 
the floor to you. Yes. Um, so uh, everybody, we're talking about open educational resources and open educational resources, uh, we, we refer to them as uh, OER. They are learning, teaching and research materials in any format and medium that reside in the public domain or the under copyright that have been released under an open license, which permits no cost access, permits reuse, repurpose. It also permits adaptation and re redistribution by others, right? So when, when we talk about OER, we talk about the so-called five R's. So I just uh, mentioned the, fir the first R stands the retain, right? Uh, retain meaning that the resource can be stored in a computer, okay? The second R stands for reuse, meaning that the resource can be used exactly as is. You found something and you just use it as, as it is. Um, and the third R stands for revise. You find something, but you really, part of it is good, but others are not. So revise meaning that you can, uh, the resource can be edited for your own use. Remix, you can take part of uh, one um, you know, resource and another part of the others, and you can mix them with other materials. And the fifth R stands for redistribute, meaning the resource can be shared with others without uh, fear of any copyright infringement. So this is pretty much the definition of uh, uh, OER. This is what OER, um, what we mean by OER, okay? They come in different formats, right? Do I have a separate questions for that or <laughs> should I go on with, with, with that? No, I, I think we're gonna stay here on this. It's like, you know, okay. there's, there's a lot more we can pull out of this too, I think. And I think it'll, okay. like personally, I, I haven't touched OER before. So I have a bunch of questions for you, Chadius. Don't go anywhere, okay? <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe uh, Sharon, did you wanna add anything on top of that? Um, I think, when, when I'm thinking about what OER is compared to a traditionally published material, the thing that really stands out to me is it's something that I can download and edit and use immediately is yeah. the biggest thing. That's amazing. And I, I think like even that helps me to envision a little bit more about it. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit about myself and then we'll open it up to the audience and see what they'd have, they'd love to share or say. But personally, I've gone out searching for OER mm -hmm. and I have a difficulty with knowing where to find quality OER, probably a mm -hmm. question for later on. But do you have any suggestions of how we can know we're in the right place? Just out of curiosity. Well, we have a separate section for that. So if, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, we'll skip we over have, that then. Yeah, we'll skip sure. over we have that. a question. Right. Am I, you know, I'm a little bit psychic today. I, I kind of felt that vibe earlier. I should have checked myself. I'm sorry about that. No <laughs> um, but, but in the chat, Gunnel says, um, you know, without worrying about copyright. I think that's a big one for OER. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any hands up just yet, but I'm sure we're just warming up to this question. Um, so I have another question about what OER even is. So this is gonna be a little bit weird, but do we know the history behind OER maybe? Well, <laughs> um, I wasn't expecting to go there, but um, I, <laughs> Chadia, have you read? I mean, I can talk about what I know, but I'm not an expert. Um, open pedagogy. Is the, the history of what we are. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm, I'm wondering how it came to be. Like, was it a social justice movement? Was it like a bunch of educators? It's part of the UNESCO call, mm -hmm. you know, uh, addressing educational inequity. So UNESCO 2019 uh, issued a call for uh, open education, equitable education, social justice, and uh, all for that. And, and OER is part of that movement, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've been reading a lot um, about the social justice question because I'm going to present on it this fall. And um, it has tried, OER has been a movement that has tried to be about social justice, but mostly coming from it at, from an economical standpoint about cost. Yes. But it <laughs> doesn't solve all the other inequities that exist, you know, if people don't have power. People don't have internet. 
it doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, so it has tried to be, uh, you know, this thing that can bridge gaps in equity, um, but it it depends. It can exacerbate problems yeah, if that's a very this good group of people Sorry. can get it, but this group of people over here cannot. Mm -hmm. And it's something um, that, you know, that the community is continuing to talk about when we say we're using OER for social justice. What does that mean? Whose mm -hmm. perspectives are represented in what we put out there? And a lot of OER is created in one place and used wholesale somewhere else without being adapted. Now we're basically taking something that was made in one cultural context and making no adaptations and it goes over here there's mm -hmm. problems with that too yeah um not to totally I'm not I, I hate to throw OER under the bus because I'm not but I do want to acknowledge like some of some of the challenges which I'm sure we'll get to later that yeah that exist with it that's a great point thank you I um, really appreciate that <laughs> There's also um, a widespread problem of the fact that most OER originating from the so-called global north and being used, you know, by teachers in the global south um, without being adapted. So basically, as they are, so they wouldn't really fit their their own uh, context. And there is also, um, you know, lack of OER when it comes to intercultural. Uh, competence as usual, um, and the fact that Sharon was talking was talking about inequity and trying to narrow inequity. The purpose is that, but the um, the irony, <laughs> let's say, mm -hmm. is the fact that the those who really uh, need OER mostly are most of the time are unable to access OER because of the in infrastructure issues of or no no internet no tech technology mm -hmm. this is um, being there so this is the the cons of so the idea the concept is really good it's it's part of a movement it is trying to narrow it's you know the purpose is for social justice in a way but the the practices and because it's still fairly new as well right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's still fairly new so the practices and and the efforts are uh, in, in one part of the world, right? And serve in one part of the world. Um, so we're talking about an information divide in here. We're talking about a digital divide uh, for, um, you know, uh, not having technology and access and devices. And also we're talking about the second digital divide, uh, which is uh, even those who find OER, they don't know how to use them. Even those who have the uh, you know, the technology to access, but they don't know how to use them or how to adopt them. So basically. there you go. Well, oh, I learned a lot today. Thank you both so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, so Gunnel uh, in the chat, she said that she, she, she's done some research and it began in 2002. Thank you. So, oh no, wait. Yeah. 2002. Sorry. Don't have my glasses on. I'm sorry about that. That's really great to know Gunnel. Thank you. Where did you, if you don't mind unmuting, where did you find that? I'm curious to know a little bit more about that. I there we go. It, but it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, while you ladies were talking, I find that question was great. I was like, I want to know. So mm -hmm. I Googled it and then that's where I found it. It related ah. to me as well. But officially, I think back 1998, but wow. officially it's been started to be used in, started in 2002. That was mm -hmm. like... Well, this is part of the open education movement. It's part of distance education and distance learning. Uh, and, and then we have the 2019 call for really using those. There we go. And make them, you know, uh, more uh, spread, spreadable and more everybody's using them. And now they have, a, you know, we have one of the speakers and Sharon and I and Charity who had hold so many webinars about OER. And one of our speakers, um, uh, Dr. Rosalind Anderson is she's one of the big names of you know of OER and open education, and she was showing us what UNESCO is trying to do uh, when it comes to infrastructure and locating who's accessing who's not accessing you know in different 
things and they have some really cool technology. It's like to, you know, like the COVID-19 thing that you see mm-hmm. and all these people using. So they're, they're doing something like that right now. Mm-hmm. Because it's part of the open, you know, open education and distant education. It's been 20 years or so for, for, for distance education. Right. And the, the movie of MOOCs as well is part of OER and MOOCs and all of that. So they all started together and MIT and edX and all, you know, those um, open courses. Uh, it's part of the same movement, but uh, has it been really used? Has it been really uh, known? Uh, not much. Then UNESCO um, made a call in 2019 to kind of highlight the fact that we still we should be using these more, et cetera. So, and that explains why it's in 1998 or 22. <laughs> One thing that makes add. a lot more sense. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. My, my first courses of uh, you know doctor students online learning. Yeah, <laughs> the introductory courses. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add on to what you were saying um, about the the adapt adapting things. One of the reasons that Chadia. Um, and our colleague Charity and I have I've been doing all these webinars and presenting has been we want to get a, raise awareness that teachers need to not only know what it is, but adapt, because the more people that we have adapting um, these materials to their local context, um, the, the better it is for students. And it's, it's nice to be able to find a resource. Um, but if you just take it and you don't make it specialized to your learners, you're not, you're not create, you're not making a material that meets them exactly where they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the digital divide that Shadia was talking about, raising awareness of how, what this is and how to adapt it so you can use it in your context. Yeah, absolutely, Sharon, and, and that takes us to, to the very uh, importance of, of uh, adaptation on, and uh, when we talk about OER research, uh, what we call the localization of OER, right? And, and there are different uh, reasons, basically, and uh, purposes uh, for um, uh, localization. Um, the, the very simple idea is, is uh, to make sure that the OER you found uh, is going to be the best fit for your context. And when we and when we say context, uh, what we mean by context, it could be a geographical context, it could be a pedagogical context, political or technical, right? Um, so this practice of localization encompasses more than just translation of materials into a local language. Let's say I found it in English, or I don't translate in Arabic, or the other way around. There's something in Arabic. I'm just going to use it in English. No, or swap photo to reflect the culture, for instance, we talked about the minorities, et cetera, and and intercultural relations. Now, localization is pretty much at the heart of um, the OER process because it exemplifies uh, diversity, it uh, exemplifies openness and reusability. And there are many different, um, you know, reasons, just very quickly, I'll I'll, I'll just uh, mention them here. The first one is to address a particular teaching uh, style uh, or learning style to adapt for a different grade level, for instance, or for a different dis- discipline uh, to adjust for different learning environments and uh, to address diversity needs. Also, a cultural preference, right, or to support a specific uh, pedagogical need, um, and uh, as well as address, you know, uh, whether a school uh, or the district or a standardized curriculum, right. These are all reasons why we need to localize uh, OER, not just you know um, take them as they are and use them as they are. I mean, of course, but if it fits your own context and needs, yes. But uh, we need should should consider the idea of localization. Thank you so much. I learned about localization today, <laughs> and like like Sharon said, like that's the main idea behind OER, and I would have never known, right? It's like almost like you have to do a deep dive to understand how best to utilize these resources. So this is a great session today. It absolutely uh, is. And it reminds me of um, a very small country in Europe uh, that was having um, a political issue <laughs> because they had adapted textbooks from a whole different country in Northern Europe. 
and they had simply translated them. So right. there was no context about history, geography, but even the translation itself could not really suit the new country and the new situation. So I absolutely agree with, with what we're saying, uh, that we need to be careful and we need to make uh, necessary adaptations. Yes, completely. All right, Lerda, I think with that being said, we're good to move on. Absolutely. So um, we'll talk about advantages now. We'll talk about um, what makes open educational resources advantages. So we talked about challenges and now I think it's right time to say <laughs> what, <laughs> what are the advantages? Why should we be using them? Sure. Mm -hmm. So I can um, speak about that uh, mm -hmm. if I can find my notes because I do have some pretty good notes here. <laughs> sure. Right. So, um, so the first advantage that everyone thinks of when they think of OER is, oh, it's free. <laughs> the cost, it's so great. Um, and, and that is a huge advantage to using OER. Although I will say if, like Chadia said earlier, if you're copying it, like on a copy machine or you're printing it, that still is a cost. Um, it's really only free if you're looking at it digitally. Um, but, and, but it's not free also to the creator. The creator spent time making it. So just to kind of keep those things in mind. Um, but I think that teachers have stronger reasons for really embracing OER. And um, the biggest one that I think um, I've already mentioned is that it can be adapted for learners um, to suit their needs. So um, that could be proficiency levels. It could be like Chadia was saying earlier, cultural. Um, if you need to make cultural adaptations, ages, you know, something is more appropriate for younger students or more for older. Um, think of all the textbooks that you've used and you thought, oh, I wish I could just change the rubric on this page just a little bit. Um, or uh, you've thought, I really like this group assignment, except for this thing. Um, if I could change this, it would make it a lot more meaningful to my students. I, I swear every time, I taught with a speaking textbook. I would look and I would just like, oh, please God, let this be the one that does a group presentation that I can just use. And every time I would be like, oh, nope. Okay, I gotta modify this again. Um, so think of all the time you spent looking at those and then you're recreating, modifying it somehow on your computer, typing out your stuff. Um, that's the power of OER is that you can download it, you can edit it and immediately share it. Um, I think that's what makes it so great. And you, do, you can do all those things without infringing on copyright. Um, when I was teaching full time, copyright was like such a small concern that I had. I was like, I just need to get through this class. I hope I'm not going to be arrested, but like, I just need, um, but honestly, like I wasn't plagiarizing, you know, what I was creating because usually what was in the textbook wasn't exactly what I needed anyway. Um, but um, now with, with, if you're using OER, you're kind of free of the little bit of guilt you might have about, oh, I use that. And I don't know if that was okay. The other thing that I think, um, that is advantageous about OER, especially for teachers of English language learners, is that because you can adapt it, you can meet the needs of diverse learners, your specific students, their needs, their identities, which is something that Colleen said earlier. Um, I think in the last 10 years, the traditional publishers have done a much better job of actually representing the um, or addressing and representing English language learners' needs and their yes. cultural experiences in materials. But teachers are always going to be closer to their students than publishers. They know the lives of their students. They know their histories. Um, they have met with the parents. They understand challenges of the of the com in the communities that students belong to. Um, and that, that is also true if you're doing, if you're teaching adult learners, not just K-12. So teachers are always in the best position to make adaptations to materials that meet the needs of their students. And when you're, when teachers have that ability to adapt, they can help students feel more connected 
to course content, but the bigger advantage is that it helps students feel that they belong in the classroom. And that sense of belonging is so important um, for English language learners who might just, they might sit down and be like, nothing in this room makes me feel like I should be here. Um, but if you have the ability to adapt your materials to, so that they are represented and that the, in, the content is interesting to them, now it's, it's even more of a draw for them to be interested in learning. Um, those are kind of my preliminary comments before we go to discussion. Yes, um, I have students, um, one of the groups of students that I had within the same group, there are so many different levels, very high performance, very low performance, some in the middle, you know. So we, as a department, it was a very apparent uh, issue, not only in my class, it was across, you know, all the, the, the sections that we were teaching and we had to adopt uh, differentiated learning uh, approaches and, you know, and change a lot of in their curriculum. I wish that I knew that thing about OER, <laughs> that thing would be, you know, useful uh, to kind of bring here and there and, you know, um, uh, to meet the needs of those students because they were very, very, very different, you know, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, now we're gonna open it up to the audience again. So just a gentle reminder, you have the option here to share your experiences, mm -hmm. to engage in this discussion, or even to ask a question. And you can do it through putting your hand up and speaking out loud, or you can do that through writing your response or your question in the chat box. And I'm more than happy to read it out to you. But this is a great question. And I'm sure we have a bunch of ideas. How is this advantageous to us? Can you think about your own teaching context and how you could help? Really interesting. Okay, I don't see any hands up yet, but that's no problem at all. Um, so what I'm thinking about in terms of an advantage is, you know, the personalization. Moving a little bit away from the classroom, I'm thinking about tutoring. This could be really, really helpful when it comes to that area, right? Sometimes we have students that have very specific needs. I need to work on this, or I have a difficulty understanding this. Right. So being able to to literally look for that thing that they need and, you know, changing it specifically so I can meet their needs. I know that they have that would be time saving for me. It would be more efficient for the student. And it also be probably more entertaining because it's things that they need, you know, that they're looking for. Not just this is the best I could find, you know, so that's really helpful. And um, the other thing, Colleen, is that um, OER come in different formats as well. They're only, you know, worksheets or, you know, some supporting uh, materials. No, they, they come in different formats. It could come as, could be as big as a textbook, so full te OER textbook uh, or full courses with everything, the learning objectives, the assessment and the content and everything uh, in there. Uh, or they could be simpler, you know, uh, formats such as uh, PowerPoints about some grammar or vocab or anything. It could be lesson plans or worksheets. And it also could be audio files, audio or video files, images, or even drawings and illustrations. These are all the different forms of OER. So these are basically, whether you're looking for any of these, there are different forms of them. You know, there you can find them available on in the OER formats, which I think it's very cool, right? That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, in the chat. Oh, sorry, Ume. Yes, please yeah. go ahead. <laughs> I can share my idea. Like for you know, when I was doing my EMED course, there were some difficult ideas that I couldn't understand from the lecture. So what I did, like I just googled the term, and I found excellent YouTube videos on those. <laughs> you know, while I was walking or I'm cooking and I'm listening to those, you know, excellent ideas like fr on French Revolution, on maybe reflexivity in research. So uh, I think like um, OER gives, a, gives us uh, like um, scopes, create scopes for exploring like different from see the thing from different perspective, you know, like opening, like I can hear Colin's lecture, I can hear Loretta's lecture, I can hear Sharon's lecture. So um, I can explore like many options on single point. So I think that's an amazing thing of OER. 
So, you know, and different learners learn from, you know, different types of materials for, for some people like, you know, um, PowerPoint presentations are better for someone like, you know, YouTube videos works better, like younger generation, they like YouTube videos, right? And for some people, like there are some set question and answer. I read something and then I take a quiz. So that also works. So, yeah, so I think that's a like, that was with me that I benefited myself a lot when I was doing like research because I was very new in research and I, I learned a lot from open resources. Yes, thank you for Zoom. Um, that's, you reminded me of one of the, uh, yes, the OR repositories. And then now when I'm doing my, um, writing my research proposal in the uh, research, right? Doctoral research uh, courses, and OER Commons have whole sections for just uh, graduate students and doctoral right, uh, students as well. Um, to, for instance, the, the most difficult part right, is the methodology. Which type of methodology are you going to use? Are you going to do qualitative or quantitative? Are you going to ethnography, case study, etc.? And they have some very, very good resources, OER resources that walk you through, explain, give examples, give, you know, samples of, you know, how you're going to be, even in terms of writing uh, uh, for graduate students. Yeah, so thank you. Yes, you reminded me of that. That's a great point. Shahira has been waiting so patiently. So Shahira, please go ahead. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to add to what Shadia said and Umutal uh, Sum said, it's a, okay, it is part of the trans transformational learning experience of students. It's like, like uh, I'm sure that many of you had like, for example, international students or even um, immigrants uh, in, their, in their classrooms. And then uh, that you can see that at the very beginning of their, um, of their learning experience, they're so much dependent on the, uh, on the instructor or the teacher. Okay, and they're the sole authority in the classroom. So gradually you can just introduce these kind of uh, open resources to them. And as Shadi has mentioned that there, there are many formats of them. If you can just tell them, okay, go to the internet and then search by yourself, they'll get lost. So I think one of the very good things that you should be doing is that, or the instructor should be doing is to guide them. And then at, the, at least at the very beginning. So to improve also their study habits, because it's again here, it's... Um, it is not only giving them the chance to explore many resources, but also to change their study habits from being dependent to being independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Thank a you. great point, Hera. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Shad. And, and yes, and that's a great point. We didn't mention that the fact that OER is not only for teachers, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course, it's for the learners mainly, right? Yes, but uh, but Om Kalsum has you know it's the the, the example Om Kalsum has like uh, shared with us it's the same thing as international students like uh, like exploring the, the the research world and finding more resources to use in the research. Yes, and there's a great framework that um, Karen Charity and our other colleague who's not with us unfortunately today uh, we've been working on are we. Are we we kind of adapted it, we made it really simpler. It's the TIPS framework, T-I-P-S. It's from the Commonwealth framework of OER. And it's a great framework that is really detailed about all the things in the process that, um, that you need to follow uh, to create OER. And there's a section for OER creators, create, creation for teachers and also for students. So not only teachers can create OER, but also students and we can engage our students into OER creation. And Shahira talked about moving from pedagogy of being independent, right, students uh, dependent to us to kind of andragogy, moving a little bit of a more autonomy. And that's very relevant to the new norm of the COVID-19 of the online learning, or at least the blended learning, where students are expected uh, to, to know uh, about, to be autonomous uh, in some way. Uh, because that's the reality of online learning. You have to be able to kind of uh, find extra resources yourself and be more independent into your learning. And if you reach OER and OER, find an OER creation as student, then you reach what we, the so-called, the new term of uh, the very end of uh, being independent, which is the hudagogy, right? That means you're totally independent. You're totally there. You can navigate, you can learn on your own, you wouldn't even need us as teachers. <laughs> you know? 
anymore, but that's um, it's uh, there. It's a recent concept, but um, um, it's uh, it's it's interesting research about being independent. And OER is a great example because OER does require you going and looking for them, or doing them, creating them, or adapting them. So that's it's a process, pretty much. It's so really Shadi, so Shadi, can you just repeat the the term Udagoji? How, how do you spell it? Okay, if you can just write it in the chat. Yeah, all right. Yeah, thank you. Also in the chat, Sharon has been kind enough to share the tips um, framework, which is amazing. So Sharon, yeah. thank you so much for that. Yeah. The second link there is the best one to go to. The first mm -hmm. one is a study about why it, it works. But if you just want to see like the criteria, I would go to the second link. That's awesome. And there's another comment that, oh, I'm sorry, Chadia, go ahead. I know, I'm just saying, Hira Kochi. It's, it's with a T, but they pronounce Hidakochi. It's the very self-independent learning approach. Thank you, Chetty. I just have one more comment I want to get to because Gunnel has been so patient and she had one of the first comments in the chat that I had completely missed. Um, and she basically said here that OER is reliable and trustworthy. So my question is, is that always true? I'm curious about that. I, I don't. Laura, I said, if you want to take we'll, it. We'll talk about it in our okay, all right. very next question. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So then I'll pass it back to you, Loretta. Okay, good. So this is our very next question. Can I use any materials or resources that I find on the internet as long as it is from educational purposes only? So is it reliable? Is it credible? Can I use any material I find? Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so no. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Like I said, when I was teaching, I was just like, I just hope they don't put me in jail. Um, but really copyright, here's a few things that I didn't know about copyright. When somebody creates something, they have copyright to it. They don't have to write a letter or fill a form out and send it away to the government and then the government will give me copyright. That's not how it works. Once you create it, you have copyright to whatever you've created. Um, so when you're a teacher and you create a lesson plan and you put it out on the internet and you're like, hey, you know, here, here's my lesson plans. Unless you have expressed around the lesson plan, you can use this. If there's no relinquishing of that copyright, it's still copyright infringement. Um, so the best way to ensure that you're doing things um, the legal way is to use things that have a Creative Commons license. And um, I think Chadia, did you have in your comments to, to talk about searching for OER with Creative Commons license? You did, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but um, what Creative Commons license does is it strips away all of the automatic copyright um, laws around a creative work. Um, so, and there's different levels of Creative Commons licenses. So when you are looking for OER, you are looking for <clears throat> OER that can be downloaded, edited, distributed, um, the most open, Creative Commons licenses, which we'll talk about, um, which leads to what the, the other question was, is it is OER reliable? Maybe, <laughs> I mean, you don't know. I will say if you're using a repository like OER Commons or Merlot, um, Merlot is a repository and a referatory. Referatory means that it'll take you somewhere else. It'll be like, hey, here's a resource, go here to get it. Our repository is a site that will hold the materials there and you can directly access them. Um, so the reputable repositories have user ratings and you wanna look at those ratings and see how other people rate those materials so you can weed out the stuff that's not great. Um, it, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. If you wanna save yourself the headache of finding something that's very high quality, go to one of those repositories and look at how other people have rated them before. 
Um, do you want to add anything on to that, Chadia? I think we've pretty much said, uh, said it. Um, there are the create, OER Creative Commons repositories, one of the um, you know, top repositories uh, per se. Uh, uh, also, there is in Canada here, we have the Open Library, the, uh, the eCampus Ontario's Open Library. It's a very good mm -hmm. resource. Uh, so I'll put in the chat for you. Uh, because it allows you to uh, find, search, you know, they, they have a collection of open textbooks, open open resource, resources, and their curated collection aligns with the top subject areas in, in post-secondary education, and it's peer-reviewed. Also, they have a section to customize, so they will walk you through how you can adapt uh, and suit your own needs, and also another section for you to become an OER creator. Uh, if, if you want to. So it's the E uh, Campus Ontario Open Library. Canada, as a matter of fact, uh, when it comes to online learning, you know, Athabasca University is uh, is leading. Um, I'm part of Athabasca University, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm doing my uh, ed D in distance education online learning, and it is whatever we go in the United States and big conferences or whatever. And it is, you know, it's a pioneer. That's how, that's what it is. And, online business, business education. So in Canada, we do have, and we are considered advanced when it comes to online learning and to uh, open education in general. So we have great resources as, uh, for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and OER, OER Commons, these are the ones, the Common Commonwealth of Learning as well, um, have, have a lot of uh, great resources, okay? Thank you so much, uh, Chadia and Sharon. That's great. Out of curiosity, would we, oh, perfect. Sharon's already doing it. I was going to ask if you can put the names of the websites that you mentioned in the chat, but that's amazing. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, I just kept talking, I forgot. <laughs> that's the exact same thing I do. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to tell you guys this whole list. And then I say it and I don't type it, you know. Um, but these websites are wonderful. We need to all make sure we copy and paste these, write them down somewhere so we have them. Um, and if you could maybe talk about the process, like as Sharon mentioned, looking at readings. Um, so like when I open up an e a OER resource, what's the first thing I should look for? Are there any clues? Let me know the quality, like, or you can even explain your process of getting them, adapting them, printing them, what exactly that you do. First thing that I look is the ratings. How many people have, I mean, it's just like looking for a restaurant in Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many people have rated this place? 20, I don't know, 1500. I'm going to trust it a little bit more, <laughs> you know? So um, I, I look at the ratings. How many people have rated it? And then when I open it up, um, if it's a good resource, it'll tell you on one of the first pages, like the target audience, all of that information. So I know right away, is this something that I can use? Mm -hmm. um, and then my own personal process for evaluating as I scroll and kind of look at how the headings are set up. Um, what's the format of the book? Is it laid out in the way that I want it? Does it have the activities that I want? Are there assessments? Are the assessments a joke or are they actually useful? <laughs> um, you, I mean, isn't that the truth? Yep. That is absolutely one of the first things I would look at is like, do you have any tests? You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and, and it wouldn't necessarily be because I just want to take it wholesale, but I could make it something a little bit better if you give me the bones, you know, I'll yeah. put some meat on it or whatever. Um, a craft test. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So earlier you, you asked about how, how do we find uh, OER or where can I find OER, right? The, um, the Rita? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, so pretty much the, the easiest way is to look for ready OER. I mean, you can make your own OER and even create in your OER. I mean, I, I talked about the tips framework and how you know well, it will um, basically give you the steps and the process. And it sounds complicated, but uh, you can you can basically start simple from what you whatever you have and you turn it into OER, take one of those licenses that you choose um, with attribution only or attribution and share alike uh, to make it and for other people to use because it's a two-way mm -hmm. 
you can find, yes, we're all looking for ready, OER, but also if we don't contribute to um, making what we have at least OER, then we wouldn't find, others wouldn't find uh, either. So it's, uh, it's for the greater good, think about it that way. But um, the easiest way to find them is, is um, for, for those who have internet access, is, is to Google, right? <laughs> right? But uh, even for those with limited internet or you know remote areas or where they have sometimes uh, public hubs or internet limited internet access, there are shareable uh, OERs and there are downloadable OERs. So it's the idea of down making OER downloadable is extremely important. If we go back to the idea of social justice and uh, educational equity and and um, you know, benefit in everybody. So how do you find them? Make a Google search, pretty much. Uh, if you go to an advanced Google search, the advanced Google search itself, at the very bottom, you will find usage rights, right? Usage rights, you can see it. The default search for those usage rights is not filtered by license. It will be just all. So you're gonna change that from the default right, which is uh, all means everything that you're looking at is potentially copyrighted, but you can filter it and change it into everything that has Creative Commons license, okay? So again, Google, advanced Google search, at the very bottom, you'll find usage rights, change from default to Creative Commons license. So um, then you will, your Google search will be directed towards finding, finding OER materials from Creative Commons license, okay? But always confirm that uh, the materials that you find there um, do have the license that you need. That makes sense. Yeah, okay. And uh, I mentioned that they come in different formats, right? So I'm gonna give you a few very selected examples <clears throat> of where you can find different these different formats of OER. So for images and photos, for instance, there are several options. Uh, for example, Flickr has uh, a search or filter for Creative uh, Commons license works for images that you need uh, to use in your or uh, in your classrooms. Uh, Pixabay, Pexel, and Unsplash are really good for kind of stock images looking pictures. They're usually CC0, meaning license, uh, which is something limited, uh, similar to public uh, domain, meaning no rights reserved. If it's CC0, you can use it with no rights reserved at all. Uh, as soon as you create something, you own the copyright yourself, right? So let me put in the chat as that for images and photos, you have here. Oh, I did that for you. Okay, yes, please. Flickr, Pixabay, yep. Pexel, and, and Splash. Okay. There are also many choices for icons and clip art that have create Creative Commons licenses. These are great for class materials, but also for building websites for those interested in having their own websites, right? Uh, for instance, Noun Project is a very good one um, because it offers no um, attribution if you have a subscription, but uh, it's a pretty low cost. But if you don't have a subscription, you can use their icons with the CC BY license, meaning use it, but just give attribution to, to where you took it from. So if you, took a, if, if you took anything, you have to say this picture, it will tell you where for who made it. And it will tell you this picture is made by Lorita from, um, blah, 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 the, um, something, right? So you have to put an end to that picture, but use it. So it's non-project is called. There's also Fleticon, which is very similar to that, but it has more colorful icons, uh, OER uh, icons. And uh, Sharon told me about this actually. It was very cool. I've been using it in my presentations lately. It's really cool. Uh, and open clip art and public domain vectors, they have uh, also great CC0 license clip art, open clip art and public domain vectors. There are websites that have news articles and um, news articles are very, used, uh, very useful for teaching because of their authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
the conversation is a good one, but uh, unfortunately it's not very open because it has the license of the no derivatives, the ND license, which means uh, you cannot make any changes, but the good thing is that you can still legally distribute these articles to your students. And uh, you can also upload, upload them on your website if you want to. So that's it's, but you can find so many uh, new stuff on the conversation. Open democracy is a really good choice. Their articles usually have a more open license like uh, CC BY, so you can use that uh, license. Uh, when we say um, CC BY license, what can we do? Maybe you're um, wondering what you can do by CC BY. CC BY is the attribution. You give attribution means others can copy, they can distribute, they can display, perform, and remix your that work if they credit the names uh, as requested by whoever who put the license, right? And share alike license is that means others can distribute the work only under license identical to the one that have been chosen for that work, right? The non-derivative one, as I mentioned, is others can only copy, distribute, display, or perform verbatim copies of the work. No changes made, okay? So just because I keep on mentioning these licenses and I'm, maybe some of you don't know what they are or just uh, to make things clear. Uh, so also uh, there is a Project Gutenberg. Project Gutenberg has a lot of public domain books. So if you are interested in professional development for teachers, you've been, I'm sure you've heard of um, ed, ed, ed tech books, right? Because yep. they have uh, a lot of great resources with Creative Commons license. These are all good quality OER. Uh, resources. So, and there's also many options for open textbooks, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Who's not with us, ha, ha, she has created her own uh, ESL textbook. Uh, Sharon, do you have the link of Charity's book, please? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll look for it. How about that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Like, Share a document, right? Kind of, uh, I should have prepared it in, but it's just real. Oh yeah, she created that um, an ESL textbook, all Greek to me or something like that, it's called, but it's really cool uh, herself. And she, it's a whole textbook for ESL teaching and she made an OER, right? But um, so the good thing about open textbooks that you can use the whole textbook or uh, as any other <laughs> textbook, you can, uh, you know, choose a few chapters uh, that you can use from one other chapters or another textbook so you can mix here and there and you're free uh, to, to use any part that you want with the copyright, with the, making all the changes with the electronic format, which is really great. You can use uh, parts of the chapter itself and you can edit uh, anything and you can add anything missing. You can yourself make that quality better if you think it's right. Mm -hmm. But and the, um, the um, Sharon mentioned that is one of the oldest resources for OER with a full open courses and also it includes lesson plans for that. And the uh, MIT Open Courseware has full courses in addition to materials, supplementary materials. These are some really good options for open textbooks and they're all peer reviewed. So because quality again, uh, clean, I talked about that and it's extremely important. It's actually one of the question marks or the, you know, whoever who is against OER, they will just come into, hey, what about quality? Well, the, <laughs> you know. the automatic argument. Right, the automatic uh, argument. For those who are in, interested in audio OER, there are some options as well, uh, which are especially useful for creating videos and, and other projects. Uh, Free PD and Jamindo have great background music options. Uh, Sound Bible and Free Sound have sound effects, right, that you can use. And Libre, LibreVox is a kind of uh, the Project Gutenberg public domain books, meaning volunteers have made audio versions of public domain texts that um, um, I think Umu Kulsum was uh, talking about, you know, the, the um, comforts of... Um, I do that as well, cooking or doing all different things, but at the same time, listening. Just sometimes we don't even have time to sit and read, <laughs> right? So you can; those are also one of the options. 
uh, for that. And um, that's it, I guess. That's what I have. Wow. We covered all the bases. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, Thank that list so that, that, chatty was saying out loud and sharing through in the chat is valuable i'm gonna <laughs> download this chat as soon as we're done here because i need these so thank you so much I yes gonna you have resources share them please i can add the list uh, of um examples of yeah uh, uh, a textbook for a writing textbook for instance that is really cool uh what i like about it that it it's about uh, English writing, so mm -hmm. paragraph writing, uh, essay writing, and the, you, know, you know, our type of adult learners who have come from very different backgrounds and their L1 is different from the English rhetoric. This is particularly uh, useful and it has all the, the um, exercises related activities and things related to it and also has modules. It has um, different folders uh, so if you click on that, you will find the textbook itself. You, you will find also the learning outcomes and even the schedule of whoever teacher that created. And here's the schedule. Here is I'm going to use it in my classroom, basically. And here's nice. the lesson plans. Here is the textbook itself with the activities. And here is also a section where you can find uh, videos and um, things related to it. So it's it's a great um, resource for that. Slideshows as well. Uh, yeah, and they have slideshows. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And also there is the Commonwealth OERELT, the Commonwealth. Um, they have a lot of money, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, they are Pirna, for instance, Athabasca University, uh, they are working with the Commonwealth uh, in making, uh, creating iMOOCs. iMOOCs are one of the most expensive MOOCs because they are based on the constructivist approach of learning, unlike the other MOOCs of even MIT, and they're not really iMOOCs, right? Um, iMOOCs are the best, basically, right now, um, methodology or approach design for MOOCs. Uh, so the Commonwealth, and the money of the Commonwealth the Project at the Basque University, they have pioneers in distance ed, their research, the professors and research. They have created oh, this uh, OER for uh, uh, ELT, because as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, English language OER for ELT is, is uh, really limited still. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why Sharon and I and Charity raising awareness because of you know what the resources that we showed you yes you find elt in them but there are more other content for and for other subjects than than uh, for elt itself so there is still a need for a big elt repository and that's our dream sharon and i and, and, and that's why we are we are trying to get you excited about oer so you will yes. be <laughs> creators of it so it will exist yes Unless people make it, it doesn't exist. Yep. This is great. It's eye-opening. And this is like what you just said, right? I think the more that we know about it, we can start talking about it, maybe start doing it. That's exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. Okay. I hate to cut this short because there's so many amazing resources. But I want to throw you all into breakout rooms because we have one more last really super important question we want to discuss. And this is it. So the question is, as a teacher... What are the challenges that you face when using traditionally published educational resources? What are or would be the challenges of using OER in your classroom? It's mm. a great question. All right, Indeed. so make sure you read the question very closely. I am now opening up all of the breakout rooms. Please feel free to go in and have a good time. And I look forward to hearing about your breakout rooms when you come back. Bye everybody, make sure you join. It's gonna ask you to join, make sure you click join. Everyone looks so shocked that they're no longer in the breakout rooms, I'm sorry. Was it a drastic change? <laughs> Normally it gives us a minute, it only gave us 10 seconds. Well, you That's see, special. I'm impatient, so I said it's 10 seconds, Colin, I hope you're not mad with me. <laughs> of course. I think they want to know how you did it. <laughs> I, you know, my Zoom secrets, they're top secret. I can't share that kind of information here. Uh, no, but if you just go into the, um, the back end of Zoom, you can edit your results. It's really easy uh, to do that. Um, but now that we have you all here, you were in two different groups. Let me 
open that back up so we can call on you. I'd love to hear what each group talked about. By the way, this officially ends in two minutes. If you have to be somewhere, feel free to leave at 8.30. But if you want to stay a little bit longer to hear about what each group talked about in the breakout rooms, you also have that option as well. Alrighty, so uh, for breakout room one, we had Colin, Deborah, Monica, and Ume. If any one of you would like to like you know, give us a brief synopsis of what happened, we'd be really appreciative. Uh, hi, Colin. This is uh, Deb so Gilbert. Okay. Hi, Deb. Our question was the drawbacks to traditional teaching resources and the drawbacks mm -hmm. to uh, using OER, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Um, so personally, I a lot of there's a lot of overlap between the two. Uh, issues with customization, not having the resources you want, stuff being hard to find, time intensive to, to fix it or tailor it for your class. It is difficult to think of examples of, uh, aside from, I guess, maybe quality with free resources, how, how would they be different in terms of drawbacks and challenges? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great point, Colin. Thank you so much. And very concise. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah, I, I heard you speaking and I'd love to hear what you have to say as well. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, uh, all of us in our room, uh, we all said, you know, that this was all new to us, this whole, um, you know, OER. So we, we, you know, it wasn't like we've been working with it for a while and then we can say, oh, and this would be a drawback or a benefit. Um, but we were all very excited about uh, looking into it and the resources. Um, and at the very end there, I was just mentioning, like, for example, I teach Benchmark 7 within ESL. So uh, what, I've, what I've looked at just tonight, I'm like, oh, this is doable. This is so challenging for like some of my, you know, like higher students and stuff. But I was wondering about like the lower levels. It, you know, again, I haven't tinkered with anything. I've just written everything down and, and Wait, gotten- Wait, sure, Sharon, one second, one second, one second. Uh, Deborah, I want to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I have to give a big thank you to Sharon. Sharon, oh, it was amazing to have you today. Sharon has to leave at 8.30 because that was our agreement and I can't blame her, but I'm going to miss you. And we had an amazing time today. Thank you so much, oh, Sharon. You're welcome. Thank you guys. Have a thank good night. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you, Sharon. Sharon take thank you. Deborah, I am so sorry. Please continue. No, I, I think, you know, again, that was sort of where we where we kind of left off was we're excited to kind of to, to get into it and see where it, where it leads. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Kind of the other, where you can go, right? Endless opportunities <laughs> with OER. That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So now we'll move on to room two. Room two was Gunnel, Mark, and Shahira. So if one or two of you would like to share what you talked about, we'd love that. You. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mark, go ahead. <laughs> No, I think that you had a lot to say. No, you, you no. We, we, okay, go ahead. Gano um, talked about the fact that uh, she had to use a textbook. And uh, what she did, though, was she pushed uh, at the boundaries of the textbook so that she could uh, adapt it to the students that she had. Am I correct? <laughs> She says yes. <laughs> Thanks, yes, Gunnel. You are. Thank you so much, Mark. That was very kind. Okay. Shahira, please speak for yourself. Uh, I just, I, I would repeat the same thing like Gono said uh, that, okay, I had to follow like um, a standardized curriculum. So many times I did not have like a free hand to, mm. to add, but I would, what I, I did is that I adapted the, for example, the activities or that the activities that were in the textbook to, to make them more interactive and more engaging to the students. Yes. Uh, also like, again here, like I tried like adding videos, um, games and whatsoever, so that it, it would be more fun to, to the learners. Uh, so this is the thing. So uh, the challenge was like following this rigid, <laughs> rigid curriculum. But again, here ad the adaptation was a, a good thing to do. And then Definitely. for for open uh, resources, it's like the thing. Of course, there are so many, and I'm very much impressed by them. But the thing is, I was so much reluctant to use so many of them because of the copyright. It, it, you know, it scares me every time, you know, I, of course, I follow the guidelines that were set by my, my school, but then again here, like, okay, I was very cautious about using them. 
Yeah. And I don't know if I was wrong. Maybe I was wrong when I was, I had this feeling, but this is how I, uh, I felt. No, we, t- I totally get what you mean. I think a lot of us feel that way. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is as instructors, we really need more information about this specific topic to understand it in depth so we can freely use it, know what to really do with these resources. Some of us that are great resources, to be honest, myself, I'm not really sure. I don't have enough knowledge to be able to use what I need to use. How is it going to work out? Maybe it needs another webinar or something mm-hmm. or a presentation to explain how it can be done. Yeah, so, like more of a how-to. Chatty, like, I might have to bother you for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, creation, you mean? Yeah, like, like it might be nice to have a walkthrough of from, you know, selecting right down to this is the final piece. I'd love to see what I your so. process looks mm-hmm. like. That would be really cool. I think it will be very, very helpful. Like mm-hmm. we have a great idea, but we don't know how to really implement or have to start, how to get going on it. Like yeah. if you have at least some sort of an example, how it's been done, mm-hmm. and we can explore further on top of that. Right. Uh, that's a great point. Yeah, the very, very simple answer to that, it's really, it's all about the license, right? Mm-hmm. The license that you use, the different license that I mentioned earlier, and uh, the, the process itself, the, there are requirements of what you really need to do. There are um, for the TIPS framework, TIPS T uh, stands for teaching, right? And pedagogy, I believe, I for information, um, P for, no, P is for pedagogy and S for system and technology. So they have different um, uh, basic requirements for the process for quality assurance, basically quality assurance for OER that you have to follow uh, when you create OER. Um, and they have a, a, it's a huge table. The process is complicated, but the simple way is to follow the TIPS framework. And we have an ad- adapted. We have adapted that. We have a simpler version. I don't know. Maybe we can have um, another session about how to do that. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. It's 8.35. So I think maybe, Loretta, it's time for us to say our thank yous. Shahira, do you want to say one? Okay, part? just uh, I, if you remember that we've attended, like there were two big session uh, webinars for open resources. I think you can find them on Totella. Uh, they were so like, I can't remember the speaker's name. but again, her, name, her, that... name is, um, her name was, oh my God. Shawa oh, yeah. Al-Noor. Oh, I, can, yeah. I, can, I, I can find yeah. it. I'll find it yeah. right now. But it was really, there were two great webinars. I think uh, we should revisit them and then there are more than <laughs> one. And also, it would be great if Shadia also like gives, a, gives us like another like example and webinars and how to create our own uh, uh, open resources. This we would, would be invite, yeah. uh, a cha- we would be, um, a charity would be also a great um you know, option for that because she created her own textbook. Okay, that's awesome, right? right? Yeah, yeah, talk about right, yes, yeah. she yeah. can talk about her own experience of uh, yeah. creating the textbook from scratch all the way to. You know. Okay, perfect. that would be great. We'll Thank plan you. that. So, for anyone who wants to contact Chadia, uh, Chadia and Sharon, here you have their contact information. Thank you. And... Um, one question. Sure. Yes, please. Um. Is there going to be any kind of um, a PDF um, slide available? Oh, can I make these slides yeah. available? Yeah. Yeah, I can. That's not a problem. Okay. They I will can make also this because um, mm-hmm. uh, what am I going to do with uh, the addresses that I just see? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, that's a, that's a very fair part uh, point, Mark. I totally get it. I can, I'm more than happy. What I'll do is um, when I email everybody the survey, I can also email them a copy of this presentation so they can have all the questions okay. and all the contact information. That's a great point, Mark. Thank you right. for that. Thank you. Um, maybe in the chat, if I may, the resources that we shared, you can put them like copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I can do that too. That's not a problem. <laughs> all right.